Okay, we'll bring the order, the meeting to order, please. And we'll start off with a flag salute. So if you could join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, at this time we'll do a roll call of the commissioners. Commissioner Runtine? Here. Commissioner Watts? Here. Commissioner DiMatte? Here. Commissioner Woodward? Absent. Commissioner Dahlgren? Here. Commissioner Herzog? Here. And Commissioner Johnson? Here. Thank you. Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's Planning Commission meeting. It's open to virtual and in person participation and may be observed online through the Placer County website. If you would like to make a public comment, the Planning Commission clerk will announce when you are to line up to provide testimony. If you are calling in, please press 9 to raise your hand. Please be prepared to speak at the time I open the public comment for the specific item that you would like to address, which may include public comment for matters not on the agenda and for consent item or for a hearing item. Each commenter will be entitled to three minutes to comment time. Thank you for your patience as we work to ensure that each citizen who wishes to comment has the opportunity to do so. Please be advised that today's hearing is being recorded. And now I'm going to move to our first item of the agenda, which is the first meeting of the year, which means we have an election of officers. And so uh, it will have uh, Chris, our planning director, kind of kick us off on that. Yeah, thank you, Chair Johnson. Uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, Chris Bahuli, planning director. I just wanted to note that uh, you should have in front of you a, a handout uh, that shows the, uh, at least based on past practice, how the rotation has gone uh, for, uh, for the commissioner's uh, officer elections. Uh, the past practice has been that it has followed a rotation of district, uh, district representatives from one two, and then the west uh, representative, followed by three, four, five, and the east uh, uh, county representative. Last year, we did uh, go a little out of order, um, and uh, District 1 uh, is serving currently in the secretary position. And so uh, what staff has laid out for you is that if you did continue to follow with um, with the um, appointments that were made or the uh, election that was made last year, if you followed the rotation and got back on the cycle, it would mean that District 1, a District 1 representative would um, serve uh, out of order or to get back on schedule that District 1 would serve uh, a little bit more um, in advance of when they normally would by following that rotation. So I wanted to provide this information for you um, so that as you uh, continue on with your elections that you have this information. Okay. And so, Missy, I'll kind of lead it off with uh, a nomination. And so I would nominate uh, Anthony D. Matei to be the chairman for the year 2024. Second. Second? Okay, so we'll do a roll call. Commissioner Rantine? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Absent. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. And Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Okay, and so I would like to nominate Robin Dahlgren to be the vice chairman for 2024. Second. Commissioner Rentine? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Absent. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. And Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Okay, and then I will follow up with uh, the secretary position, which will I'll nominate Daniel Woodward for that position. If I could, real quickly, um, our prior practice on the Planning Commission has been to read off the person who made the motion in the second. Um, it may be something I suggest we continue. 
Um, this is Nathan Herzog. I'll do the second. I did the second for all of them. Okay. Just so you know. All right. Uh, motion by Johnson, second by Herzog. Uh, Commissioner Rentin? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner DiMatteo? Yes. Commissioner Woodward absent. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. And Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Okay, and with that, uh, bear with me while we do a little musical chair right here. And I'll turn the meeting over to our new chairman. I really just want to use the gravel. <laughs> but I can't adjourn us yet. Okay, following elections, um, I would now like to have the um, planning director come up for his report, please. Hey, good morning. Uh, Chair DiMatte, congratulations. Um, before I, I get started, I, I, uh, we might be taking this a little bit out of order on, on the agenda, but I did want to start by uh, introducing the clerk of the board uh, and their representatives. Um, we've been mentioning for the last few meetings now that we were going to be transitioning with Andrea uh, Dashiell's uh, movement away from uh, that desk uh, in, into other things within CEDRA, and so wanted to take a moment to, uh, to have Megan introduce herself and her team. Hi, good morning, commissioners. I'm Megan Wood, I'm the clerk of the board. Um, we are very excited to be working with you guys and I'll give you just a quick background on kind of our mission when we clerk meetings. So our goal is to provide the public with access to all documents and ability to um, participate in all meetings. That's our main goal is we prepare the agenda items and provide you with the documents. We also want to ensure you have everything necessary to properly make your decisions on matters. After that, our goal is to produce the, what is referred to as the administrative record. That record is everything that brought the hearing to where it got to and got you to the vote that you're at. So we're really excited. Um, the planning team has been amazing. They've been great. The transitions, you know, changes are always challenging for all of us, but everyone's been working through it. A few changes that we are already implementing is we have updated your website. So we have moved you, um, your website now looks very similar to the Board of Supervisors website for their agendas. This will allow us to post the PowerPoints that are presented online for the public to see. That way they can go back and reference them along with the comments that they have submitted on the items. Those will be able to be accessible online now as well. The other thing that we are in the process of Finalizing is the public hearing notice. Um, so public hearing notices are posted in the paper. They are also mailed out to residents within a specific vicinity of a project, as you know. That is not always the best way to reach people. So we have started posting all public hearing notices on our clerk of the board website. We will be doing that for the planning commission as well. So those are a couple changes that have happened so far. We will continue to um, make improvements and kind of bring the Planning Commission in line with how we handle the Board of Supervisors. So very excited to, to work with you guys. And if we can ever be of assistance, please let us know. Kelsey Anderson will be your main clerk. Um, she is wonderful and amazing. And she's been with our office for three years now and has uh, she's just she's just flourished there. And she is also our guru on any kind of historical records. So if there's ever anything you are looking for that is old, Kelsey is able to find it in a heartbeat. So anyway, again, thank you very much for this opportunity and we look forward to working with you. Okay, so I do have a, a few updates that I'd like to uh, share with the commission. Uh, the first, as it relates to um, some, some um, uh, actions that were taken by the Board of Supervisors and upcoming actions before the board. Uh, the first is earlier this week, the board did consider our long range work program. Uh, it was a very um, uh, informative discussion. Uh, the board did provide uh, direction on uh, various topics that were of importance to them. Particularly, there was quite a bit of discussion about the 
uh, wine and farm brewery ordinance and accelerating uh, updates to the ordinance. We did mention, and I, I, I'd like to note for the commission that uh, we were informed that we received a state grant to uh, prepare an agricultural plan for the county. And that's really excited. It's over half a million dollars um, to update the agricultural plan, to not update, but to create an agricultural plan. Um, I believe that that plan will uh, provide some guidance as far as updates to uh, the wine and farm brewery ordinance, as well as provide some guidance for our upcoming general plan update as well. Uh, the timeline of the agricultural plan update uh, will be in advance of when we expect to complete our general plan update. So again, it should um, uh, should coalesce nicely as a, as a work product. Um, so ultimately, uh, the board provided some direction. We're going to incorporate that. It didn't uh, result in any adjustment to any of the uh, work program or any of the tasks that we have in the work program or the timelines that we have previously laid out for the planning commission. Uh, so you should expect an, an annual report on our work program. So later this year, we will be bringing that back before the uh, back before the commission. Did want to mention um, at our last meeting, I noted that the um, that the Simpson water feature appeal that Granite Bay uh, project um, was scheduled to go before the board in late uh, January. Uh, the, based on the appellant's uh, request, that has actually now been uh, moved out a little bit. So we're looking at uh, the February 13th uh, hearing of the board to, uh, to consider that appeal. And then uh, lastly, as it relates to board items, wanted to note that uh, we are planning for it, the, house, the next housing rezone workshop occurring on February 20th. So that is the tentative date, but that is what we're, uh, what we're looking at there. As far as upcoming planning commission meetings, uh, we are finalizing an agenda for January 25th. We have two items. Um, uh, we have a uh, condition modification for Auburn Creek side, uh, which is you know, just across the street here. Uh, and then we also have a map modification for, uh, in the Tahoe area. So two items that are, that are likely coming before you on the 25th. Uh, at this point, we're not seeing any items on our advanced agenda for February 8th, so tentatively we are looking at, at canceling that meeting. Just wanted you to be aware of that. I uh, uh, have a couple of other sort of more logistical or housekeeping type items. Uh, most of you have gotten back to our team on the uh, Planning Commissioner Academy down in Long Beach, March 6th, 6th through 8th. Um, so we have a, a handful of you that are, are going to be attending. If you haven't gotten back to our team yet, uh, please do, but we're looking to finalize travel arrangements in the next week or so. Uh, lastly, I did want to take a moment to acknowledge that this is uh, Commissioner Herzog's last planning commission meeting. Uh, today caps a nearly six year run on the planning commission. Uh, including being the chair last year. And I, unfortunately, I didn't get to work with you as chair last year, uh, or the year before, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but I know that there, was a lot, there were a lot of items and the, there was a lot of good work that you did. Uh, so on behalf of planning and CEDRA staff, I wanted to thank uh, Commissioner Herzog for his service on the Planning Commission and to Placer County. Um, I do know that we have, um, I believe we have uh, Supervisor Landon on the line. Uh, who would like to make some remarks. So with the chair's concurrence, I'd like to uh, provide her with that opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Supervisor Landon, can you unmute your mic and give your comments? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear yes. you, Supervisor Landon. <laughs> Yay, okay, thanks. Well, I just, uh, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person because I just think the world of Nathan and am so 
thankful for his service on the planning commission. And Nathan, I just want to say thank you for your dedication and your sacrifice to the community and, and just for being a great partner for me and for uh, my predecessor, Robert, on the planning commission. We really, really appreciate the time that you have put in. And um, I look forward to hopefully you getting engaged in other methods throughout Placer County and um, just thank you so much. Really, really appreciate you. Thank you, Supervisor Landon. Appreciate that. Would anybody else like to comment? Yeah, I would. Or Nathan. Yeah, I've been uh, here the whole time that Nathan has been on the Planning Commission and really appreciated his participation that he's provided to the Planning Commission. has always been very thoughtful and especially uh, responsive to the public comment and what the public's feelings were. And so, <clears throat> Nathan, I want to thank you very much. Appreciated your participation on the Planning Commission. Anybody else? Uh, myself. Thank you. I, I don't even know what to say. There's, we'll have a beer later. <laughs> no, you've been great, and I appreciate all the help you've given me so far. Is that it? No more? Okay. And, and with that, that concludes my planning director's report. Okay. Thank you, Chris. It's weird being in this seat. <laughs> so next, I will now open public comment for any matters not on the Planning Commission agenda in person, followed by anybody online. Would anybody in the audience, do we have anybody making that would like to speak in public comment? Yeah. You can come up, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for ha ha uh, giving us this opportunity. <clears throat> My name is Greg Grime, and we moved up here from Danville three years ago to uh, <clears throat> Winchester Country Club. We live on the 10th hole. For the last three years, we've had to endure the uh, legacy lawn maintenance equipment, which is up to 20 years old, with no mufflers. Uh, they have a start time uh, under Placer County of 5.30 in the morning. And even with our double pane windows, uh, we are woken up. The golf course has had multiple owners. We've tried to appeal to them to do something with their equipment to no avail. I, re I represent a group of, um, of, of us Winchester residents that would like to explore getting the start time changed right now it's uh placer county ordinances uh start time is 5 30 a.m from may through september 7 a.m october through april uh, they do maintain the, the lawns throughout the day so the argument that they have to start before the golfers get there doesn't work i i have videos uh, the equipment exceeds 75 decibels i have a decibel meter and several of us do. And we're thinking maybe these t start times were created back uh, by Placer County for municipal golf courses that didn't have any homes lining them. Uh, we don't know. So we just want to see, find out where do we start to try to get the start times changed. Uh, we've been studying like down in Palm Springs area. Same problem. They changed it to eight. 8 to 9 a.m. in the morning. So that's why I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody online? Anybody in the audience would like to speak? Is there anybody online? I see no one, Chair. Thank you. I will now close public comment. Commission or uh, Chair Yeah, Dimitri, sorry. If, if I can just um, re respond to the... Um, to the uh, to the speaker to the speaker yes, um, that we'll have we'll we'll talk with the speaker following the meeting um, and and talk about the appropriate way to make changes that that would be a change to our noise ordinance which is um, you know, not typically something that the planning commission would take up right. um, but we can talk about that with, uh, offline with the okay. speaker great thank you Chris I appreciate that I'll give one more chance nobody else in public comment. I will now close public comment.
Moving on, I will move to the consent agenda. We have one item on the consent agenda, which is an action item from the December 14th, 2023 meeting. Would any commissioner like to remove this item from the consent agenda? Seeing nobody. Do we have anybody, members of the public, that would like to wish to comment or remove this from the consent agenda? Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Second. Commissioner Watts, Commissioner Johnson, roll call. Commissioner Rentine? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Absent. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Herzog? Abstained. And Commissioner DiMatte? Yes. We will now move forward to our first uh, hearing item, which is item two on the agenda. It is the County Acres Solar Project. Can I? Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, Jennifer Bias here to present this item. And the PowerPoint isn't moving forward. If guys in the back could unlock it, I'd appreciate it. Oh, there we go. Now it's moving forward too quickly. <laughs> okay, again, Jennifer Bias Planning Services. Um, before I get started, I do want to kind of introduce the team. There's quite a few folks that have helped put this staff report presentation together and are here to answer some of your questions if you have any. Uh, first, I really need to thank our senior planner, Chris Graham, who's sitting over here. Um, he did a, quite a bit of work getting this item here before you. Um, unfortunately, he is actually, uh, tomorrow is his last day. So um, I got to step in and finish his great work that he's started on. We also have Phil Franz with Engineering and Surveying, who's also sitting there, as well as Lee Chavez, our environmental coordinator, and then we have <clears throat> Greg McKenzie with the Placer County Conservation Authority, as well as Jeremy Sutter with our Placer County Conservation Authority. And then also, I know there's another presentation from our SMUD team, but our main contacts, Amanda Beck with SMUD, as well as Eric Crane and Amy Spitzer are here to answer any questions um, on their application also. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Today we're talking about a project It's called the Country Acres Solar Panel. It's being proposed by um, SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility District. Thank you. Uh, located in West Placer, here shown in the red box, kind of give you some geographic locations. It's west of the city of Roseville, north of Sacramento County line and east of the Sutter County line. It does sit in between advisory councils, um, so there actually is not within any municipal advisory councils for this project. Again, our project vicinity getting a little closer here. Shown in the yellow is uh, the outline of the proposed project area, and we'll get into the components of the project. But to the north, we have Phillips Road, and then to the very south is Baseline Road, um, and then the city of <clears throat> Roseville uh, is right here on our map. <clears throat> also included again in this project is a portion of the regional university, university specific plan and we'll kind of get into that. I have some more graphics on that. And then also Curry Creek and the existing transmission line is located here. So our existing zone is, zoning for this site is farm combining 80 acre minimum as well as shown in the yellow or gold is our zoning for a regional university specific plan um, again geographically the specific plan areas it all does sit in the general plan site with the exception of the areas that are shown in the regional university specific plan and kind of again getting you oriented placer vineyard specific plan is to the south these are just some photos of the existing conditions on the site, looking towards Baseline Road to the south, as well as some of the agriculture activities that's currently going on. Again, 
agriculture roads that exist today, as well as um, I think the picture on the left is the regional university site. So the project that's being proposed is an electric generation plant as we define it in our zoning ordinance. And that includes multiple components for photovoltaic. There will be battery storage, as well as a substation switch yard um, and interconnecting line and all the facilities um, for that. Uh, the list here is showing, and I'm going to get into more detail, but it uh, proposed is a 344 megawatt facility. Battery storage would be 172 megawatts, or about four hours. Again, in the subyard switch station, we'll get into the locations of those. Also being proposed is uh, continued agricultural use of sheep grazing, uh, some photo agriculture photovoltaic, and I'll get into a little bit more detail of what that is, um, as well as, again, some um, other activities we'll talk as we go through the presentation. The time period uh, proposed is 35 years with the decommissioning, with the exception of the substation and switchyard. The project size is 1,170 acres. Approximate uh, how many homes would this power is about 80,000 homes. That's just an estimate of what could be. And then again, the construction period is starting in 2024 this year and would take about two years for the project to build out. Getting into a little more detail and starting our first kind of bird's eye view, shown in the black hashed area is the solar modules and the collection system. Again, access will come in off of Phillip Road along the yellow roadway. And this yellow is a uh, access as well as um, other feeder routes and other items that will be um, proposed. Um, the orange area is our, um, again, our underground feeding routes. The battery storage area is shown in the red hashed area. I have additional um, site plan that gets into more detail. Um, as well as our um, orange hashed area, I believe, is the switchyard. Again, our blue line is our interconnecting uh, existing facilities. And we'll talk a little bit about fencing and lighting for the site. This is a very colorful map, but this is the site plan that we're looking at approving. Kind of broke down so you can get a better feel of what's going to be proposed. Each one of those uh, colors represents their cells um, or their layout in blocks of the panels. And then uh, the roadway, they're actually leaving this for a potential future road uh, that could go in here in sometime in the 35 years right now. It is um, on a plan within the Department of Public Works, but there is no approval for any of that uh, roadway, but it is being left available. Um, so the northern portion, again, this is the very top of the site. Um, and this is our central portion. Again, here's Curry Creek. And we'll talk a little bit about our floodway and our floodplain on the next couple slides. We'll have perimeter fencing that um, provides security for all of the uh, solar panels and other facilities. I've got to catch up on my notes, sorry. This is a more detailed site plan of the switch yard being proposed, located here. The substation also being proposed and then our uh, battery storage area is proposed here. Again, all of the uh, utility lines and converters will be connected underground down to this area. This uh, black square area is the proposed agriculture photovoltaic area, which is a demonstration 10-acre site that they're proposing for researching crop yields uh, with solar panels at varying heights and row spacing that would allow farm equipment to, till, to continue utilizing the sites. So this is their 10-acre demonstration site um, that they are proposing. Again, just giving you some visuals, photo or, uh, solar arrays, as well as what typical vests or battery storage areas look like. 
And again, a typical interconnection. I think this is a photo simulation down here of the connection to uh, the existing uh, lines, the existing power lines. Uh, one of the questions that we have and provided in your staff report is uh, how much of this service area, SMUD service area, is actually within Placer County. So depicted on this graphic in the red is shown where the project footprint is and located. Uh, the blue-lined area is, again, our Placer Vineyards and Riolo Vineyard specific plan. The yellow hashed uh, includes uh, SMUD's service area. Currently, Shown in the brown, I believe, is about 3,000, a little over 3,000 customers that reside in Placer County. Uh, SMUD is estimating that would go up to around 5,000 uh, that would actually reside in Placer County. Included um, in the conditional use permit being proposed is conditions for the decommissioning and site restoration. Uh, again, the permit would expire after 35 years and the uh, entire site would be decommissioned through a decommissioning plan that would be approved. We would anticipating that de that decommissioning plan would use the practices in place at the time. But as an example, if they were decommissioning today, they would recycle and reuse as much of the facilities and the equipment that they could. And then they would properly dispose of the rest of the equipment they would restore the site back to similar grades, um, restoring and making sure that any roads left behind were not causing runoff problems. Um, and any parts and pieces would be salvaged um, as they could likely be salvageable um, now and in the future. But that decommissioning again will happen in the future. And again, as a part of the conditional use permit, we've included a condition that would uh, financially guarantee that decommissioning did occur, that they wouldn't walk away and leave these panels in place. You guys are in the back. My PowerPoint is not advancing again. Hmm. Okay, CEQA compliance. So through a cooperative agreement, uh, SMUD and the county staff have been working together to complete the CEQA process. Um, an EIR was prepared. SMUD is the CEQA lead agency for that EIR. Um, and they have processed the notice of preparation, which began in November of 2021. They did held their proper scoping meetings, as well as released a draft EIR that was circulated for the required 45 days. The draft EIR evaluated all of the required environmental resources in the vicinity and provided the analysis of impacts and proposed mitigation measures. The Planning Commission actually held a public meeting on October 13th, 2022 to collect public comments as part of this process. Those comments, as well as all the comments that were received, I believe there was nine comments letters that were received on this project, um, have been included, responses have been included to the Final with the final EIR, uh, SMUD certified the final EIR on April 20th, 2023. And so pursuant to CEQA section 15096, responsible agency, which is Placer County, um, is also going to use that adoption, the certified final environmental impact report that was prepared by SMUD um, for its conclusion and there is recommended findings of facts and statements of overriding consideration and an MMRP that you will be making, being asked to make a recommendation on to the board on this project. And getting a little more detail of the analysis that was performed, again, uh, CEQA has their required resource areas. 15 of those resource areas were considered less than significant with mitigation and or had no impact. There were two resource areas that were considered significant and unavoidable, one of which was agricultural resources, and the second one was air quality. We'll talk a little bit about agricultural resources in the next slide. And the air quality has to do with, again, construction, and during the construction, there will be temporary impacts that will exceed our air quality standards. There is mitigation that has been included in the air qualities, 
provided in detail, um, but it still is at the threshold of significant and avoid unavoidable. Again, the finding of facts, overriding considerations have been included for your recommendation. I did want to talk a little bit about the agricultural piece on this project. Again, there's about 872 acres of rice and about 131 acres of almond orchard that are within the existing footprint of this project. SMUD as and it's included a mitigation measure that would mitigate for the loss of mapped farmland, important farmland. Um, it's about 44 acres of state important farmland and 858 acres of unique farmland. Shown here on this slide is the options proposed under the mitigation of how they could achieve loss of uh, the farmland. They're doing a one-to-one -one mitigation, which again, why we are at the significant and avoidable is they will still be a net loss of farmland with this project being proposed. They could, option one for mitigation would be to provide in-kind easements. Option two would be to pay a land, local land trust or a reputable land trust to also acquire and maintain agricultural land or easements. And the third option, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about more, is to participate in the Placer County Conservation Program through an in-lieu fee program uh, the county has been working, or excuse me, I should say the Placer Conservation Authority has been working with this applicant to come to terms on a memorandum of understanding that would allow for um, in-lieu fees to be paid. This payment would include mitigation for both the biological impacts as well as cover the agricultural impacts. This is very similar to a lot of the projects, larger projects that we've approved or through the last decade have been approved where um, the mitigation properties serve as both biological and agricultural mitigation. Again, even though we do have a net loss here, um, we've included conditions to allow, again, the right to farm for existing operations that are adjacent to this use. We'll still have the right to farm, um, even though it might create dust and other nuisances that uh, this property owner would have to deal with. And again, SMUD's intention to continue uh, grazing and provide that 10-acre section that's earmarked for UC Davis for their co-location to study crops and solar shows their commitment to continued agriculture use on the site. Okay, the project entitlements. So with this project, we have a general plan amendment. We'll get into more details. I go through this presentation. Uh, they're looking at a modification to a policy related to uh, development in the floodplain, as well as adding a new policy to development in the floodplain. There's a very minor amendment that's being proposed in the regional university specific plan documents to allow consideration of this use in advance of other things being approved under that plan. And then again, the conditional use permit is the main entitlement for the operation of the power plant, power generation plant. So again, power generation plant, conditional use permit, this is just our definition of what a facility is that we consider a power generation plant, and they are meeting that definition. Attachment E in the staff report provided a general plan consistency review as it relates to this project. I've only included a couple policies on this slide, but there are a few more in, in the table that was presented in the staff report. And I wanted to talk about these ones because I think they're important to acknowledge. Um, and the first ones are related to public service. Um, there is a need for public services in this area as it relates to fire, police, and public protection, as well as infrastructure. Um, and these general plan policies require that new development provide these types of services. The county has been, again, working with the operator, SMUD, and has negotiated a development services agreement that would be applied, um, that would apply an annual payment towards providing uh, for these services. An approximate payment would be close to a million dollars um, that would provide services for police fire and other public services in this area. Um, I would also point to, again, our consistency review, our sustainability, the Placer County Sustainability Plan, which is part of our general plan, has policy E or 
I think it's not policy initiative E23, which is again to support um, the proposed projects that increase renewable energies that are carbon free energy productions. So our um, policy documents include um, links to supporting and being able to support these kind of projects um, for large scale alternative energy sources. We do have one policy, again, we'll get into this, that was determined to be inconsistent. They're proposing an amendment to that policy, and I have a few slides that I'll walk you through that. It's policy 8B14. But before we go there, we're gonna talk a little bit about general plan consistency and the Placer County Conservation Plan. The general plan does require, again, consistency when we review a project policy in our general plan states that, uh, oh, sorry, I need to explain the slide before I jump into the policy. The green area is showing the potential future growth under the Placer County Conservation and Plan, and the purple area is showing the reserve acquisition area. So what do those mean? Um, the reserve acquisition area is the anticipated location of where the county or the PCA will be purchasing easements and or land for permanent conservation. And the green area, the potential future growth, is the area that is just might in, be anticipated for future urban growth or development. Neither is dictated as in it's a mandate, but this is what the conservation strategy outlined the difference. This project's entirely located within the um, green area with the exception of the very northern portion which is within the reserve acquisition area um, and then the second part where i was jumping to <laughs> before was that under the conservation plan large-scale solar and wind projects are actually excluded from participating in our program and the reason why they were excluded that was at the request of the state and federal agencies was that it was too difficult at the time that they were reviewing and approving our conservation plan to assess what actually the impacts of such a project might be. So they said, your permit will not cover that. They will have to come through the normal channels. State and federal permitting will be required. So um, because it's in the PFE, um, the future potential growth, it still does need to meet the goals and policies of our general plan. And one of the important policies linking to the general plan and the PCCP is that when you pr approve a project, it has to be consistent with the PCCP and also show that it's not gonna prevent the county from meeting the goals and objectives as it's outlined in the PCCP. So what that means is if you take 1,000 acres of green area out of our conservation strategy, without participating in our program, that over the life of that program, the 45 years left of that program, the program not, might not be able to meet all the goals and objectives because it's a thousand acres short. It didn't get mitigated as it was anticipated. And again, a lot of that an mitigation is anticipated through payment of fees. So if the, this prog program is not participating in the, in the PCCP, there might be a financial shortfall over the long term, and therefore our general plan hasn't been met. So I know that's, I'm, lo I'm looking, anybody got questions about that? Because I feel like there's a couple faces. Who's going to manage the long term look at the mitigation plan, whether or not these parcels and acreages are taken out of the plan and that they are mitigated over 20, 30, 40 years? Yeah, great question. Um, our, our The program, again, I, I have some knowledge, basic knowledge, but our real expert, Greg McKenzie, is here to answer your questions. But, but ultimately, kind of the simple answer is it is the Placer County as authority that will be in charge of collecting fees, purchasing land, and managing the land in perpetuity and making sure that happens. The county's role is as we as development projects are proposed and go through the process, that we require they meet their general plan obligation to participate in the plan and make sure that we are able over the life of the plan to meet the obligations, the goals and objectives of, if we say we were gonna mitigate a thousand acres of rice, that over 50 years we will mitigate a thousand acres of rice. And I'm just making that number up. 
don't quote me, but that's kind of the general concept. The second part of that question is the reserve acquisition area. Who ensures that that truly is a reserved area for that acquisition and it just doesn't get taken over through development? Yeah, good question. The reserve acquisition area is has was adopted right um, with the general plan. I'm going to give you my basic answer. I'm sure Greg can give you more details or correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it's uh, again not necessarily controlled by ordinance. It's a policy document. So if you're allowed to do something uh, by by the existing ordinance and general plans in that area, in the purple area, PCCP, build houses, farm that all those activities co can go on. But where we, the county would have to pause would be if somebody proposed like a land development out in the purple area, mm -hmm. would the county still be able to demonstrate that we could meet our goals and objectives of the plan if a certain amount of acreage of the purple was lost to another land use? There's enough acreage that it should balance, but it's something that we have to prove up over time and it's a 50-year plan. Right. There's enough acreage now. Yes. Exactly. I'm thinking that's why you have the acquisition reserve acquisition area yes. so that you can keep a track and watch over that. That was a good explanation. Thanks, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Mark, you had a question? Yeah, just a real quick one. There's a removal of this 1,000 acres out of the planning. I don't know how to describe it. Have any effect on the um, housing rezone effort? Does it put pressure on the rest of the county to make up sites for the rezoning that we've been working on? Uh, good question. Uh, no, this currently this property and then this location is designated as farm in our general plan, and it's designated farm 80 acre minimum, with the exception of the area that's the specific plan. And we'll get into what's being impacted within the specific plan, what's being proposed. But I can tell you that no housing is being impacted. Anybody else? Uh, go ahead, Nathan. Come on. Um, after the 35 years and the, the site is decommissioned, um, what is the opportunity for collection of fees again in development in this area or rezoning back to ag? How, how, does, that, how does that play out after it's decommissioned? I think it's, you know, land use can change over time. So currently, if nothing changed in the next 35 years, and the site will still remain zoned farm, it could go back into active farming use and whatever's allowed by the zoning under the farm zone, right? This area is also in the county general plan as a future uh, study area, and therefore there is likelihood that there will probably be a future development proposed out here. Now what that is and when it comes in and how it gets approved, would all be the future planning commission if you're still sitting on the planning commission mm -hmm. or board 95. of supervisors. I'll be dead. Right. So I'm not <laughs> sure if I'll still be here. <laughs> so does that that help? I mean, if they, they truly decommission and at that time if they mm -hmm. were to decommission and put it back in agriculture. But I think the main question you're asking is once you've mitigated for land mm -hmm. biologically, agriculturally, we can't go back and double dip and say, yeah. well, no, you actually have to mitigate again. Mm -hmm. So I think there was some initial discussion of, well, can't they just mitigate it in the future when it turns maybe into houses? And unfortunately, if you're authorized to take of habitat through a state and federal permit, you're authorized that and you don't have to come back and ask again. It's my and understanding. It, and if this isn't the right time for this question, you know, the difference between the fees if you're building homes versus this project, you know, uh, do we have know what that number would be? Um, and and that you, you did actually answer my true question at the end there. So um, what would the difference in fees be if there were homes being developed? And if that's going to come up later. Um, like what do you, I, maybe I don't 25 understand, million, clarify. Is it 25 million? So I think, right yeah, number? you're getting yeah. into the question of with the development fee for, or excuse me, the mitigation agreement that is being proposed with the Placer County Conservation Plan, mm -hmm. the fees are being based on the fee schedule, and I might get out of, out of whack here, uh, that is currently in effect today. And the, the difference okay. would not, the differences don't distinguish between land uses. So impacts of solar panels, I believe, equate to impacts of if you were building a house. Anybody else? 
thanks for the question. I had the exact same question Nathan did. So back to you. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. So again, uh, I don't know if I stated this part, but as part of our conditions and as part of this process going forward, they are agreeing to and the board will be considering and the uh, participating in the conservation program. And I believe the state and federal agencies are also in agreement. Uh, that program will, or that participation will be done through a development agreement or a mitigation agreement. That agreement will be between the Placer County Authority and uh, SMUD. And that has currently been negotiated. And I think I have some information on the terms. So again, they'll be paying land conservation fees based on the footprint of the project. Those fees will also cover the statewide of importance in farmland. So the PCA will be obligated to make sure that it meets both the biological requirements as well as any agriculture requirements. Um, and again, they'll be participating in any impacts. The projected fee collection estimates are around $25 million, and that does not include all of the special habitat fees. Uh, they're still being estimated, but I think the information Jerry, Jeremy gave me was $350,000 currently uh, for special habitat. So that's if you're impacting like a wetland resource. So it's our uh, belief that um, by entering into and funding this, the, the, the project itself would also be consistent with the general plan because it would be, again, funding and participating in the conservation strategy and not leaving the concentration, concentration, the conservation strategy um, with a whole. All right, moving on. Uh oh. Guys in the back, my com your computer went to sleep. All right, the general plan amendment that's being proposed with this project is related to our health and safety element of when development goes in the floodplain. We currently have a policy 8B14 that basically states no construction in the 100-year floodplain. Um, we are proposing, or they are proposing to amend this uh, to state that with the exception that would be allowed, and then we're pointing to a new policy, 8B113, that language is shown here on the screen, was included in your staff report. However, I do have to point out that the language in the staff report did have, was actually incorrect and had a sentence that needed to be deleted. It was on page nine of your staff report. Um, and it's the language that states there's a one foot depth. Um, it is correct in our resolution and correct on this slide. And I'll get into it because my next slide kind of breaks down what this policy is getting at. Um, so this policy is getting at, sorry. I guess I didn't include that. Okay, so long-term non-permanent solar generating projects. Again, solar panels would be allowed in the floodplain west of Highway 49. They, couldn't, they would look at and consider vegetation and wetlands and make sure the impacts were less than significant. Um, they wouldn't allow areas of the floodplain that um, have not already been previously altered. Um, the grading and increases to the water surface elevation would be minor and that the stream is not an anadromous fish bearing. That means a salmon bearing fish stream. So staff took a look at all of the parameters that are being proposed with this new policy. And we came up with an analysis using our GIS database. Um, the areas shown in green and red, really difficult to see on this map, would be areas that could potentially be uh, impacted in the future, um, but it breaks down to a little over 3,000 acres might be impacted with this change to our general plan by allowing solar panels, non-permanent solar panels, to be in the floodplain. <clears throat> I think I got my total here. And also included here again is the, the watersheds that we're looking at the Bear River, 
kind of shown in gray, Markham Ravine and the Pleasant Grove Creek are all of the watersheds that fit this definition that, again, in the future might allow, if somebody proposed solar panels, we could consider these locations. It's about 3,298 acres. With the SMUD project, there's 84 acres that they're proposing that would be potentially located in the 100-year floodplain. And it depicted here on the exhibit, again, our flood depths, current estimated flood depths would be post projects. But you can see where the black areas are the, you know, panels over the blue areas would be the areas where <clears throat> the panels would be allowed in the floodplain. One of the unique things about this area is it has been actively farmed and our floodplains in and around this areas have already been altered. So that's part of the reason why we're considering this modification to this policy is that these floodplains have been altered. There is no safety risks in the way that they're proposing to construct this. Our floodways out in and west plaster are wide and shallow versus up in the foothill where they're deep and narrow, faster moving. Again, our decommissioning plan does take into account to restore any floodplain consistent with the general plan policies and any kind of habitat protection and policies that are in place when they restore and decommission. Okay, so regional university specific plan is our uh, specific plan that we're proposing a minor changes to. This is the land use uh, diagram from that plan. And mainly what I wanna point out here is there's two geographic areas within this plan. This is the community area shown in the yellows and reds and oranges. And our 600-acre university is shown in purple with, again, the drainage all being green. Staff did a comparison of what's being proposed under this Country Acres project. And they are proposing at the very eastern corner to about a little less than 50, it looks like 48 acres, would be placed under solar panels on the university site. So the university site under the specific plan is a campus master plan that would be approved later um, when the end user comes in and proposes a campus on this site. Right now, the property is currently held by Hillsdale University. They have not approached the county on proposing a campus master plan. Um, but they are uh, willing to lease some area to our operator for um, this project. So with that consideration, as we were reviewing the documents within the regional university specific plan, the process for have us issuing a conditional use permit or any other entitlements on this purple area, they needed to do what was called a campus master plan. So we're adding a clarification as shown in yellow that we can consider that any use other than an electric generating plant project, which requires a conditional use permit, would be allowed prior to a campus master plan and the university site review process occurring. So it's really just clarifying that we, they don't have to have a full campus master plan in order for the county to look at a use permit for solar power on this piece. That little purple area in black. And so I say little, it's 48 acres. But out of 600 acre campus, it's not significant. Um, also again, same thing, like all of our specific plans out in West Placer, um, we have this, um, we have development design standards. The university was really, um, the users was envisioned to be a full ca campus master plan university. So we're just adding a clarification that again, through the conditional use permit pro process, electrical generating facilities can be considered within that land use. Because there is really in that plan, there isn't a specific, here's what the university zone, you know, you can do these uses. It was more of we'll decide that with the campus master plan. So we're adding those two clarifications to our specific plan uh, with this request. Again, public review and comment. Uh, we talked about all of the notice of preparations and the CEQA process that this project has gone through. This is just outlining all of them. There was also an information e meeting uh, that um, 
they presented their information about the agrovoltaic uh, to the Agricultural Commission in February. Um, and again, they released their final EIR in April. We also provided a town hall in November of 2023. Um, that was both in person and online. We only had one public commenter um, on in that uh, town hall. We also presented this item at the request of the supervisor to the Granite Bay MAC for the general plan amendment in December. Um, during that meeting, there was some public comment and questions about why SMUD's proposing this project in Placer um, and when they don't have very many customers, as well as concerns about the general plan amendment opening doors to additional solar facilities coming in um, and concerns about, again, allowing uh, projects within the 100-year flood plain. After the publication of our staff report, we received three comments, one in support uh, that and also one providing additional information about sheep grazing benefits and also one from PG&E just stating they had no comments on the project. And with that, I will state that staff is here to recommend that the Planning Commission recommend approval to the Board of Supervisors for consideration of this project, be adopting a resolution related to the final environmental impact report adopt a resolution for the general plan amendment, adopt a resolution related to the specific plan amendments, it's not moving forward again, adopt an ordinance that again would amend the regional university specific plan as well as approve the conditional use permit. All of the findings necessary uh, to support this are included in your staff report as well as attachments and I'm going to Take questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I forgot to mention if there's members of the public that would like to comment, they could raise their hands. Press star nine if you are calling in to begin, queue, to begin queuing in for public comment on this item, um, which will um, already has been presented. So sorry, I missed you know announcing that. Um, now back to our commission. If we have any questions for staff. Seeing none. I do. Oh, you have a question, Nathan. I do. Maybe this is for Greg, but um, <clears throat> have we thought about where we might acquire land um, in Placer County and use the fees? And just want to know a little bit more about some ideas around where we might actually use the fees to purchase land. And, and Greg, have you thought about that, or is there a plan for that? Yeah, good uh, morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Greg McKenzie, your Placer County Conservation Program Administrator. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the MOU with SMUD actually is tentatively scheduled to go to our Placer Conservation Authority Board next week, Thursday. So agreement is still in draft form subject to their approval. Um, but yes, as we've been working with SMUD to identify mitigation sites, sites that would accommodate not only the agricultural side, but also the species and habitat side. Uh, good news is there are lots of opportunities in, in Western Placer County for this, um, sites that have the required soils to meet the mitigation obligation that SMUD has under CEQA as well as you know, those same lands provide habitat to species that uh, we have listed and uh, are covered under the conservation program. Tricolor blackbirds, Swainson's hawk, similar species that uh, would inhabit this area and our modeled habitat uh, for the project area is our modeled habitat under the conservation program. So um, the good news so far is if you've watched any of our Instagram posts or the PIO, public information officers post. We've been very successful in acquiring lands. We have not run into an issue of not having enough people stepping forward willingly to provide lands. We actually have more demand on the people willing to sell conservation easements for agricultural or species purposes and a lot of interest in selling lands for mitigation purposes. Um, you know, obviously we prefer conservation easements, especially for agricultural practices over having to own, manage, there are different cost implications for that. So uh, 
that hopefully that answers the question. There, there. We yeah. can't specifically name sites currently. That would probably be um, difficult. You know, people start I, to understand. I what, figured. Yeah. I guess maybe your opinion for the next question would be. 25 million sounds like a lot to me, but perhaps, you know, in the purchase of these lands, it may not be. In, in your experience, do you feel like this is enough money to be able to purchase the amount of land to, to replace what we need? Yes. I, you know, the, the fees in the draft agreement, roughly totaling $25 million, are consistent with the fees that we would otherwise collect for land conversion. So what does the conservation program cover? It covers the conversion of natural, in this case, semi-natural agricultural lands into future urban or suburban <clears throat> types of uses. <clears throat> so these would be the same and consistent with the fees that we would otherwise collect. Uh, we review those annually. So if, for instance, fees, some of them came in currently, some went longer, we update our fees annually. Uh, subject to inflationary forces, the Board of Supervisors uh, adopts those ultimately. Uh, we also have to do a nexus study every five years pursuant to the Mitigation Fee Act. So, yeah, we, we have to keep up with uh, inflationary forces and other forces in our fees. Make sure they pay for the mitigation that's required. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Chair, not yet. I have... Greg, I have one more question. Sorry. Um, Nathan, you brought up a good point. You know, is that enough money? Um, if you took the $25 million and divided it by 1,100 acres, that's only $22,000 an acre. What has been the current purchase price to go purchase land on average for agricultural land in Placer County? Because I know it's much higher in other counties surrounding Sutter County, Sacramento County. Yeah, so we look annually. Uh, we use, um, I'm probably not going to get the name of this index correctly, but we track uh, appraisers' values of lands for agricultural purposes. I don't have the, the name of that index off the top of my head, but we follow that carefully, increase our land conversion fees to be consistent. So, for instance, rice in Placer County, a little bit lower than what you might see in, in you, you know the agricultural market better than I do. Uh, but lands in, Plas in uh, Sutter County, for instance, why is that? Sutter County tends to have better yields for rice than, right. than we do in Placer County. Um, you know, the majority of our ag in western Placer County is grazing, tree crops, and irrigated you know, pasture. Uh, right. There are others, as you know, but down in this area, we're, we're talking about an equivalent for these soil types, and so equivalent for these soil types are right within our threshold of uh, where we would experience land. So you, know, you could be for, for rice in western Placer County, $10,000 per acre for our, a higher quality crop, you could be higher than that. So we think we're right in the, the range with our current fees to be able, able to go out and acquire these lands. Um, working with the Ag Commissioner, uh, Josh Hunsinger's office, we've been talking to him, looking at, okay, what lands would he consider to be suitable for this type of conservation? So it's similar, you know, irrigated cropland lands that have these soil classifications that we're looking for. They're out there, uh, and we have to get those. And it, right. what happens if, <laughs> under this agreement, we don't or can't get those lands? Right. We would basically transmit those fees back to SMUD, they would be responsible for providing that mitigation if we couldn't deliver it. That's the, really the only mechanism for what, what if we can't do it. So part of the ground being taken out is almond trees, right? Maybe like 800 acres of it? No, I don't have the totals. Jen may have the totals. Just because I'm, I'm you know, this. thanks for Nate for bringing this up, but 131 acres. <laughs> Obviously, you're not going to grow almonds everywhere, so that piece of property is probably valued a little bit higher, maybe at thirty-five to forty thousand dollars an acre. So, how do we go about adjusting that? Because on average, uh, I'll go buy that land if it's twenty-two thousand dollars an acre. That seems pretty cheap. Uh, yeah, at that rate. for the conservation authority, our focus will not be on the particular crop type; it'll be on those soil types. So, really, right. we are looking for. The replacement soil is the 
you know, sequel mitigation requires not necessarily the, the crop itself. Yeah, you won't grow, well, people try, so okay, that's fine, thank you. Great, is today your last day? No, no, oh. Chris Graham's last oh, okay. day. Okay, never mind. I, ha I have a ways to go. <laughs> You're gonna be here a long time. I was worried. We're not letting you go. We're already losing people, we're not losing anymore. <laughs> Unless you know something I don't. I <laughs> Chair, if you don't have any other questions for Greg, I did have a comment that I wanted to make about this project generally before we get to public comment. I'm, I'm good, thank you. So I uh, wanted the commission to be aware that there are also potential avenues for this project to proceed outside of the county approval process, because I think it's something that you should consider as part of your decision. Uh, Assembly Bill 205 was passed in 2022. Uh, and that allows the State California Energy Commission to certify utility scale solar projects over 200 megawatts uh, without going through local approvals. That's a certification process that would include notification to the local agency, the county, um, and findings from the state that there's an overall net positive benefit. Um, but that would um, provide ultimate approval for the project to the state um, if that avenue were pursued. In addition, government code section 53096 uh, also allows the SMUD Board of Directors through a four-fifths vote to override county zoning ordinances for electrical energy transmission and storage facilities uh, if it determines there's no feasible alternative to the proposal. Um, the result for that, it, it would also divest the county of jurisdiction to consider the project. So um, here under both of those avenues, um, the county would lose the ability to condition and decide or approve this project. So staff has worked collaboratively with SMUD uh, throughout the past few months, uh, maybe longer, to review the project and provide conditions that, in a manner that would allow this to proceed through the county's land use authority process, uh, but that also uh, meet the project objectives of SMUD. So that's what you're seeing in terms of a proposal here, um, and something that you should consider as part of your decision. So we would also lose that mitigation fee too then, correct? Potentially, yeah. Potentially. Potentially. Okay. Anybody else? Any further questions? Seeing none. Okay. Um, the applicant, would they like to come up and provide comment? And I would like to ask the applicant if he's read and is supportive of conditions. Uh, yes, we are. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman DiMatte and members of the commission. I'm Steve Johns with SMUD. Uh, Thank you for uh, having us with uh, the commission today. It's been a three-year process of working with the county, and I appreciate county council's uh, comments about alternative approval mechanisms that, that, are, that are available. Uh, I think our three-year work with the county staff has demonstrated that we do want to work through the county process. And we've worked really diligently to find a set of conditions that will allow the project to go forward to benefit SMUD, and also that will bring benefits to Placer County. So. Um, uh, I, you know, Clayton, thanks for, for sharing that. But we are here to talk about the process that we've been engaged in for, for quite a while with the county. Uh, we do appreciate staff's uh, efforts on this. You know, Jen and Chris and Chris, uh, they've worked really diligently with us through a variety of issues. And it's been, uh, it's been collaborative and it's been challenging uh, to get through some of these things. But it's been really beneficial. We think that the project that's before you today is sound in the conditions of approval are also appropriate for what we have proposed. I wanted to, I, Jen uh, introduced some members of our team. We have a lot of members of our team here, but I, I want to just have, point out, so because they might be speaking today, Eric Crane with SMUD's Government Affairs, uh, Amanda Beck, one of our project development managers, also Sarah Cheney, another one of our project development managers are here. And they all have uh, you know, key roles as subject matter experts in bringing this forward today. Um, Jen did a great job of covering this, and so some of our slides are duplicative, so I'll whiz through those because you don't need to hear the same uh, information twice. We want to kind of set the stage by looking at some of the key infrastructure here. And um, Jen brought up, she, you see the project site is in red in the upper left-hand corner, and she identified where our transmission corridor was with our transmission lines. And you can see it's sort of a, a yellow, and, uh, or yellow, yellow and white that go from uh, left to right. Uh, into Roseville from down in Alberta where we have a major substation. And I'll tell you why that's important in a second. So uh, we currently serve 3,100 households in Placer County. 
the population of that is a little bit over 8,000. So we think we have about 8,000 Placer County residents that are SMUD customers. And when our service area is fully developed, we anticipate there'll be over 8,000 customers or over 21,000 residents, uh, Placer County residents who are SMUD customers. And it gets confusing sometimes between customers, which we look at as a meter, uh, versus the number of people who actually live in the household. So this site is key because it does border our transmission corridor, and that brings in benefits to, obviously, to us, but also to, to Placer County in, in some other ways. Um, <clears throat> you know, first of all, we, we run, we operate something called BANK, the Balancing Authority of Northern California. It's a JPA, or Joint Powers Authority, that's comprised of six public utilities, including Roosevelt Electric. And the purpose of a balancing authority is to make sure, and Cal ISO is a balancing authority, and you've all heard of ISO, for the investor-owned utilities in the state. Well, this is publicly owned or government agency-owned uh, utilities like SMUD is. And with the balancing authority, it's our job to make sure that the electrical load or the demand that people have meet the generation. And you need to have infrastructure in place to make this happen. And you need to have the generation resources that make it happen. And having uh, this project that's directly tied into our transmission in this location benefits us in, in serving as the operator for bank to make sure that those six utilities have the, uh, have the voltage control to have you know, reliable and stable electrical service. It's also beneficial because SMUD does look at our resources as not only our resources and those that support our bank members, but also that things that can help out other people around the state, and especially in our region. And when uh, having resources in key areas like this will help us export if we ever need to meet uh, emergency demands with other utilities like PG&E or, or to the ISO. And a great example of this is the heat storm from 2022 in September. We had multiple days that were over 110. You probably remember that uh, ISO was having to consider or enact brownouts for certain parts of the state because of uh, the lack of generation capacity. And in the, the peak of that, SMUD was able one day to export 300 megawatts of electricity to support the ISO. Um, not, you know, not something we do every day, but it's something that we look at as our obligation to make sure that we can benefit uh, the greater, you know, the region, even outside our service area or people who are part of bank. The site's also um, important uh, to us just because it, it will allow us to re retire some of our natural gas fired power plants. And uh, that's gonna improve regional air quality. We all know that the air quality in the Sacramento region is not, not great. Uh, childhood asthma is very, very high in our region. And uh, particulate matter doesn't stop at the county line. So by having us start to you know, bring more, even more renewables into the portfolio, it'll help us improve the air quality in the region. Finally, the site is great for us because we do have willing landowners that wanted to engage in a lease for, for 30 years. It's a um, you know, plus or minus some years for the uh, decommissioning. <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's helpful because it's a great location for us uh, and for the project and for the region, but it also because it allows the landowners to go on and, and, and do whatever they want to do with their land after the project's been decommissioned and removed. Uh, Jen covered um, all of this uh, right here. Um, it's important, you know, we, we did spend a lot of time with uh, the county to make sure that we could preserve the transportation corridors so that it would promote, you know, future uh, plan growth in the area. So we have two MOUs that are in place. So we've talked a lot about the mitigation fee MOU with PCA, uh, and that was a great, uh, was a, lot of, a lot of energy has gone into that to make sure that it's something that, that will work. Uh, we also have a develop, what we call the development fee MOU that we've worked with with the county. And we wanted to address um, different concerns about you know, whether or not there was tax revenue that was being lost or what it could look like. And so we wanted to be able to have some revenue stream that would benefit the county, uh, specifically to benefit fire protection, public safety, and public, protect and public protection infrastructure. And so we went through a lot of different discussions. We had a lot of economists involved to see what this might look like. And we uh, arrived with an annual payment that's a little bit less than $1.2 million a year that goes to the county's general fund for the life of the project. It'll start in 2027 when the project has been commissioned. And when the project is done and is, goes into decommissioning, then the, the payments will stop. <clears throat> um, the, we had a lot of discussion about the PCA mitigation agreement. Um, I, don't need to, I don't need to reiterate that, but it's been a, a very beneficial process to work with PCA. We're looking forward to going to the PCA board uh, next week for approval of the, uh, of the agreement. 
So there is an economic benefit from the project to, uh, to Placer County. So during construction, we, uh, we know that the project's gonna support up to 360 jobs uh, and contribute more than $41 million to the local economy. And while the project went in operation, there's not a um, significant number of employees who are on site, but maintenance is always ongoing. And we, we know the project's gonna be providing at least $3.7 million to your economy each year. Additionally, we've established a local address in Placer County for the project, which means that all the sales tax that gets imposed on the equipment that's getting purchased for this will come to Placer County. And there's a significant amount of equipment that's getting purchased for the project. So uh, we mentioned three of the, agri or the agrivoltaic component. I'm gonna have Eric Crane uh, come up and talk about the, the two, or the ag components and uh, talk about the project schedule. Eric? Perfect. Good morning, uh, Chair DiMattei and Commissioners. Um, this is a, a very exciting part of the project. Um, agrivoltaics as a concept is something that really only came about in the late 1980s. And so uh, what we're doing here is really um, the first time that something like this has been done in California. It's the first time that SMUD has uh, partnered in this way with UC Davis. And it's the, uh, going to be the biggest agrivoltaics facility on the West Coast. Um, and what's exciting is that this pilot program could become uh, something that is replicated throughout solar facilities across the country. We know how important agriculture is to Placer County. We heard it from, from you uh, when we came before you earlier. We heard it from the Ag Commission uh, last, uh, last year. But really, this opportunity allows us to look at how crops can benefit from having solar and from uh, growing under those solar panels. Uh, our, our friend over at UC Davis, Professor Majdi, likes to describe it as uh, harvesting the sun twice. So not only is the panel collecting energy, but we're also using that energy to the benefit of crops. Um, so if you can imagine, we actually learned just this week that rather than a 10-acre site, it's most likely going to be fully a 20-acre site, and you'll have varying uh, panels at different heights. So 20 feet, 10 feet, 6 feet. Uh, some of the existing almond orchards that are out on the site now are going to try to be preserved under those 20-foot panels. And the benefit of the solar panels is that by growing crops under the panel, you might be able to extend the life of the, uh, the growing season by a month or so, depending on the climate. During the summer, you might have more shade. So there are distinct benefits to, uh, to exploring agrivoltaics. We're exciting, excited to partner on that project with UC Davis, and we're excited that it's going to be in Placer County. So this is really going to be something that uh, nationwide, there may be other universities that want to learn what we're studying here and what we're finding out. In addition to that, we have pollinator and grazing benefits. Uh, this is not a, a, a new thing for us at SMUD. We have uh, Rancho Seco 1 and 2 uh, over near the uh, iconic uh, nuclear uh, towers in, in Sacramento County. Uh, that's where we use grazers to make sure that all that shrubbery is taken care of. Uh, we can't use goats because goats tend to jump on panels and uh, sometimes eat the panels themselves, but we do use sheep and uh, we have a fantastic grazer. I believe he uh, sent a letter in. And so this is an opportunity uh, for us to support agriculture in that capacity as well. And then we also have pollinators. Um, we know that you know, the almond orchards rely on poll pollinators to uh, thrive each year. And so bees and moths will uh, be around the facility uh, and supported as well. Um, lastly, I just wanted to talk about our partnerships in Placer. We've been at this for a while. We've had great relationships working with county staff to get us to this point, but we've also been out in the community. Our community engagement team at SMUD has been phenomenal at really getting involved and engaging with local residents and local uh, businesses and, and commercial representatives. And so we are active members of the Lincoln, Rockland, and Roseville Chambers of Commerce. We've supported events like Splash, like Hot Chili and Cool Cars, and we continue to do that. We want to invest in this community. We have customers here, and we are, we are a part of uh, Placer County. Additionally, you know, we are a, a longstanding member of the North State BIA, supportive of their housing efforts to make sure that uh, we have housing in the area. Uh, and just generally speaking, as the, the balancing authority of Northern California operator, we work closely with Roseville Electric customers as well. We're all partners to keep the, the power on. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Steve Johnson. Thanks, Eric. Uh, for the timeline on this project, and we've covered a little bit about this, but uh, we mentioned that uh, we want to be at the we'll be at the PCA board next week. Our goal is to get to the uh, the board of supervisors uh, the second week of February. Uh, I was working with staff just before this meeting. It may or may not happen, but we still would really like to get there uh, if possible. And if approved, the project construction will start later this year and conclude by the end of 2026. 
So, um, Chair DiMatteo, we're happy to stay here for questions now, or if you want to have us come back uh, after uh, public comment. We'll no, if anybody that. from the staff has questions now on the commission, we'll open it up to. I, thanks, I just Steve. want, I just yeah, want to ahead. disclose that I've met with the applicant several times and appreciated their their uh, their answering my questions and thoughts, and so I just appreciate my time with your team. So, thank you. Thank I you. also met with the applicant yesterday and went over the project plan because I had some questions. So, my questions have all been answered. Me too. Okay, I think we'll we'll come back. We'll open up to public comment. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, is there anybody in the audience who would like to come up and speak? Wow. Yes. We have. Did they fill out cards that are those are in no order? Might you come on up first? First. You're you're first. Coming first and last, maybe. No, I think there's one more. Mike Garabedian, so you, we've had an hour and a half from the county and the applicants and their consultants and so forth, and it looks like we're going to have three or six minutes from the public. This is laughable. This, is, this process is not working for this project. You have a huge responsibility on you as the representatives of the public, the only people who really have a chance to meet. Do they meet with the public? Do they invite us out there? to do something about this. I mean, I've, I've already used up a minute of my time to criticize the process and hope that somehow you will figure out a way to rescue it. Um, and I, I don't even know where to begin. It's preposterous to be putting a solar field in a, a floodplain. That is just ridiculous. And you know, the, 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 the definition of where these projects are going is because of a particular willing landowner, they're called. This, this should be defeated and sent back to do something that doesn't have the agricultural and other impacts. I mean, the floodplain thing is enough in itself. Um, there was no discussion of the Williamson Act. They didn't mention the three. You had a, a Mickey Mouse presentation. Well, that's a little strong. It, it's better than that, actually, better than Walt Disney. But they didn't present to you here or at other prior, prior meetings or the public the three uh, significant, un, unfixable, I forget what the right term is, under CEQA, but the, um, uh, there are three problems that can't be, they can't be mitigated, major problems, and they didn't describe that to you. Why not? Why didn't you get the facts, any of the facts that would suggest there's a need for more, more consideration of this? Um, so, uh, Uh, why do I happen to be the only public member that is, you know, paying attention to this? I come to these important presentations to learn what's going on here, and um, and it's in the context of a county where basically development is completely out of control. And let's talk about the Placer County Conservation Plan. It's going to the PCA next week. It doesn't mean anything. It's automatically already approved. It's been worked out. There's no desk out here where the public can go up and talk to PC, the, the Placer County Conservation Authority, the PCCP. You can't, they don't, you go there and say, I'd like to talk to somebody about it and learn about it. How does it, I don't have, I'm not a landowner there, but how does it affect my property? You have to call somebody up and talk to them on the phone. So it's, it, that is an un, unworkable thing. It's it's a um, uh, it it, ha, it works with a an independent review team that is made up. Uh, it's secret from the public. The public doesn't know about the meetings. They can't go to the meetings. It's it's, it's as far as I know, it's still convened by the Army Corps of Engineers, and um, uh, and then. They, what they, they have this huge, I've seen, I saw an early long list of all the intakes that go to PCCP where they decide what to do and, and what not to do. And that is not part of the public process. What goes public are land acquisitions and other things, but all, the main work that they do goes, apparently goes straight to the county staff and, and, and through the process and the public is, doesn't have a handle on that. The PCCP is a Michael, pay, I'm gonna, uh, your, those, Michael, your time is up. Yeah, um, well, you mean the public is going to have three minutes or six minutes, and then it's over? At, I, I, well, let me, yeah. There's something wrong with this process, you know. Your time is up. I, there are other people who would like to speak. And well, I then want may to, I speak I after? want to grant them their time. Okay, may I speak after they're done? No. 
I, it, I, if we open it up to that, everybody can sit here and rotate all day long. Not that there's a lot of people here. I don't know how many people are online, but everybody's given three minutes. Well, it would be, I'd be great if there was a, you know, more than one or two people. Thank you, Michael. You're not welcome. Would anybody else like to speak? Seeing none. Any hand, anybody online? I see none online, Chair. Great day for democracy. Thank you. I will now close public comment, um, seeing there's no more. Um, I will bring it back to the commission. Is there any? Chair, Chair Dean. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, if I'm out of line, let me know, because this is only my second time. Uh, no, I just wanted to provide one response to one of the one of the comments that was made by Mr. Uh, Garabedian. Um, he brought up uh, William, any Williamson Act contracted land. Just want to make a, a, a note for the commission that none of the land that is uh, <clears throat> part of the subject property is uh, um, under a Williamson Act or is contracted land. So wanted to make sure to make that point. Okay. Uh, also, I'd like to address what he said. Um, you know, I, we can't control what public comes here or doesn't come here so that's out of our hands it's not like we can go out and talk to people and tell them to come here it's up to you guys as a public um, also you mentioned it about being in a floodplain you know I've owned a lot of properties in floodplains other farmers have owned properties in floodplains and to put something like this in a floodplain I don't think is an issue or a problem, especially that they're going to be six to 20 feet off the ground. Um, the floods that I've been involved in, we've had 20 feet of water and lost a lot of stuff. Um, the PCCP, I think in, it states in the report that everything is done. So, um, with staff, yep. yes, I issues. Yeah. Um, so that's all I have to address the public, and I'd have, like to have staff and the applicant come in and address the public as well, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I don't think we have any additional comments to make at this point. Okay. Would the applicant like to come up and speak anything else? No. No, only if there's uh, questions that we can answer for the commission. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> do you have a question, Mark? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I just have one question, um, maybe two. Uh, first off, what other areas, if any, were um, examined by SMUD before you landed on the property that's before us today? I'm just kind of curious. And in what regions of the of this were there any of these in the SMUD um, envelope? Hi, Commissioner Watts. This is Amanda. My name is Amanda Beck. So yeah, we we've been searching for land in this area for a long time. It's because it's on the northern part of our, our system, it makes a lot of sense uh, to interconnect on that tr transmission system. It helps with the overall production on the facility, the overall movement of electrons through our transmission system. So we looked on the, you know, you can see it's very close um, to the border for, for Sacramento. We looked very close to the Alberta substation. Um, connection cl on that Alberta, the Alberta to Foothill, Alberta to Orangeville lines, which is what those yellow lines were and white lines were, rec were showing on the, on the picture. Um, we looked right around the Alberta area. We just, there's specific plans, the reserve acquisition area. We wanted to stay out of the specific plans, stay out of the reserve acquisition area to, to make sure that we were consistent with the PCCP. Um, so it really puts a very limited area that we can focus on. And, and again, the other piece is we really focus on areas that have limited environmental impact. So, you know, that the challenge is you, it's environmental impact on the ag side or environmental impact on the, on the you know, in, the species side. So here, there's, it's limited on species, but you have ag. So the, the thinking for us is how do we make that better? How do we ensure that we can co-locate solar and ag? And so we know that we can do that with sheep grazing. We've done it. It's been done for years in the industry. We know we can do it with pollinator habitat. It's been done, it's been done for years. The next step is really crop production under panels. And that's why that piece of the project is so important because that advances that agrivoltaic, tech, the technologies that can be used. And really, you know, I, I, you know people said it, but um, this will be really in the nation the largest 
demonstration project that's been done. It's a, a, an opportunity for plaster to really be put on the map for agrivoltaics. So I guess, and just a little bit of a follow-up, the South Sac County area would not meet some of those factors in terms of the environment or proximity to SMUD major lines? Yes, so we um, we are still looking. We, we do look in the southern part of our service territory. Um, you know, our Rancho Seco 1 and Rancho Seco 2 projects were built um, just very recently. Those were commissioned. Um, so that's there's a 160 megawatt project down there and a 20 megawatt, uh, about a 12 megawatt project, I'm sorry, that were built. So those, we, we do look down there. I think the, the key here is really balancing that, gener that, that generation. And it, it really, when I, Steve said it, it really does help to be able to support at Alberta, Roseville, to support Kaisa, the California Independent System Operator, because that station, Alberta, where this project, <coughs> the, the electrons will flow, it has you know, major regional implications. It has the ability to really switch energy around in a very quick way. So it's a, um, it's, it really does represent an excellent location for the whole region. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate the answers. Just one, one more quick question. So the, the property owners in that area where you're going to purchase or more likely lease the land, they were all willing participants as property owners of their property? Yes, yes. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily a question. But let, me... let me see. Yesterday I asked, uh, when you look at the condition of use permit, there's a lot of drilling. Uh, discussion in the use permit and I think it was answered for me but it may be worthwhile to explain what the drilling is about in for the Commission's purpose too sure um, yes I can explain that so um, Commissioner Johnson asked about the um, drilling and what that is is, is it, it's only where we have collection lines so collection lines are where you take the, the really the generation that comes from the solar panels um, and they all, that all goes into cables that will go down to the switchyard, the substation in the switchyard. So that those cables, to get under some of the wetlands that are out there, so we do have wetlands out there, um, but we're set back from them, except where we have to cross over them. And so instead of going over them and, and impacting them on the top or trenching through them, we do horizontal, horizontal directional drilling, or HDD, um, where we'll go under those um, those wetlands and that by going under there you you drill and when you drill there's potential for what's called frack out what the industry calls it um, but that's um, you know drilling mud that could come out um, and so there's plans to ensure that that doesn't happen in a way that could be impactful to the environment so that's that's the drilling that we're doing there's um, other than that there is no drilling plan um, we do have the potential to build a well out there um, planned, um, but we don't think we need it. Um, there is a domestic well, or there's a ag well out there that tests well for for um, domestic water. So we may be able to use that for the um, the facilities at the switchyard and the substation. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you uh, commenting again on that. Yeah, no problem. I have nothing else. Steve, you were going to say something. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, thanks. I just want to follow up with Commissioner Watts because I think that he was also maybe asking about whether we're looking at other solar opportunities in uh, Sacramento County, for example. And uh, if you look at the plaster, uh, the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors, they just approved a project called Slough House earlier this week, I think. And it's uh, it's a different model where uh, a developer, they're getting it entitled, but we're contracting for all the output. That was just approved. It's uh, kind of uh, sort of in central eastern Sacramento County. There's another large pro project that is under the same sort of business model that's also kind of in the same area uh, that's being considered. It's going through the process with Sacramento County. Uh, we're also looking at uh, two or three other sites in Sacramento County that are in different stages of, consider of, of you know, project development before we go forward. Um, but just so you know that it, you know, we do look in our, in, in our main service territory in addition to the Placer County area. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Um, now I'd like to bring it back, I guess, to um, the Commission for Deliberations, if we have no other comments. Chairman, I'd like to make a comment as we're discussing, and that is just a reminder to the public that sometimes the best way to get a full thought out, you know, three minutes is tight, 
is to submit written comments. We read all of those and we really take those to heart and ask questions to the applicant, to staff about those. Um, and sometimes those are the best ways to communicate your full thought. I encourage you guys to do that. If you're watching the recording, um, we really uh, enjoy when the public provides thoughts and comments. And we had a few submitted here uh, for this project and encourage you guys to submit written comments. It's helpful. Um, I also um, have had time to review to review this and I'm, I'm in favor of it. I, I have just an overall thought and that is, you know, you know, these fields of solar panels, what's kind of like Placer County's big picture plan with those? Because um, if more and more of those come into play, I wonder how that could impact our development plans. Um, and and it, it's almost like overlapping development. Sometimes you can use solar panels on top of buildings and, you know, parking structures can have them. And, and so, um, uh, I'm in favor of this plan. I think it's well thought out. It makes sense. I'm a, I appreciate that how Placer County is going to benefit from it. That was a real concern that I had early on. That was addressed really, really well. Thank you for your investment in Placer County. Um, and so I'm generally in favor of it. Um, I'm really excited about the UC Davis connection, uh, you know, world-class agricultural university and the opportunity for students to be participatory in this research um, that could benefit not only us as Placer County, but the rest of the state and maybe the rest of the country. And to learn things from a project like this is an absolute added value. And to dovetail on what um, Commissioner Herzog said, we got a 60-page presentation from one of the supporters of this project, and we do read everything. And I do agree three minutes isn't a long time, but if you do have a lot of comment, and a lot of thought, putting it in writing, it does get to us, and we do read everything that we are provided. That's all. Anybody else? Time to ask questions. Yeah, you can ask questions. This is directed to staff. I got a quick question on the developer fee MOU, the $1.2 million piece that goes to the general fund. Is any of that earmarked for specific areas, or is it just dumped into the plot? It'll be placed in, into the general fund, uh, and as was mentioned, it'll be used to offset uh, fire and, and um, sheriff services, but it will be placed into the general fund and allocated from there. Okay. So it is somewhat earmarked back though, or sup, sup, supplement? Uh, I'm sorry, it'll it'll be allocated as part of the general fund. Okay. Yeah. So it's not earmarked for a specific right. area. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion if uh, if we, there are no other commissioner thoughts. Okay. Uh, commissioner Herzog, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt a resolution considering the county acre solar project final Environmental Impact Report, SCH number 00211103307, Attachment G, prepared and certified by the Sacramento Municipal Utility District SMUD and CEQA lead agency in adopting the mitigation monitoring report plan, Attachment G, Exhibit 3, supported by the findings in the staff report. And this is a recommendation for approval for the Board of Supervisors. Second. Nailed it. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Runtine? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Woodward absent. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. And Commissioner DiMatteo? Yes. Uh, just to check, could I ask who the commissioner was that seconded the motion? Commissioner Johnson. Johnson. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to further make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors that we adopt a resolution to amend the Placer County General Plan to modify General Plan Policy 8B14 and adding a new Policy 8B113 to allow non-permanent solar electric generation projects proposed by a public utility with a conditional use permit within the 100-year floodplain as shown in Attachment H to the staff report and supported by the findings in the staff report. I didn't say the periods, is that okay? 
Second. Understood. Okay. Second. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. <coughs> Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Runtine? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Absent. And Commissioner DiMatteo? Yes. I'd like to further move that we make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors to adopt a resolution to amend the regional university specific plan to allow consideration of conditional use permit for electric generation plant projects prior to approval of a campus master plan as shown in attachment I to the staff report and supported by the findings in the staff report. That's the I, right? Not lowercase l. Yep. Okay. Second. First roll call, please. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Runtine? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Woodward absent. And Commissioner DiMatteo? Yes. Can we ask the uh, AV team to advance to the next slide, please? please. Yes, thank you. thank you. I'd like to further recommend to the Board of Supervisors that we adopt an ordinance to amend the regional university specific plan development standards and design guidelines allow consideration of conditional use permit for electric generation plant projects prior to the approval of a campus master plan as shown in attachment J to the staff report and supported by the findings in the staff report. Second. Commissioner Herzog? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Rentine? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Woodward absent. And Commissioner DiMatteo? Yes. And for my final motion as a planning commissioner, I'd like to further recommend to the Board of Supervisors to approve the conditional use permit for the construction and operation of a solar facility on 1,170 acres of land that includes PV solar panels, battery storage facilities, interconnection facilities including a high voltage substation switching station and interconnection to the existing smud transmission system as shown in staff report attachment b for a period of 35 operational years and subject to the conditions of the approval as shown in attachment c to the staff report and supported by the findings in the staff report second commissioner herzog yes commissioner johnson yes Commissioner Runtine? Yes. Commissioner Watts? Yes. Commissioner Dahlgren? Yes. Commissioner Woodward? Absent. And Commissioner DiMatteo? Yes. Well, that concludes our hearing for today, so I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you for coming. That was the best part.